Hi, everyone. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this really important session of Justice in Action. My name is Tess Summer, and I'm with the Stern Center for Social Responsibility at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. If this is your first time joining us, Justice in Action is a conversation series with the JCC Social Justice Activist in Residence, Ruth Messenger, and New York City Council Member Brad Lander. Each session, we discuss a different social justice issue and the way that it's been impacted and exacerbated by COVID-19. When we initially scheduled this week's conversation, our intent was to discuss the city's discriminatory approach to social distancing enforcement. However, in light of recent events, this conversation has grown both in relevance and scope. With the devastating murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and countless others, and the ensuing protests that have reached every state and countries across the world, it's become clearer than ever that we all have a responsibility to understand the systems that led us to this pivotal moment in history. We're honored today to be joined by Ashley Sawyer, Director of Policy and Government Relations at Girls for Gender Equity, and Councilmember Donovan Richards, who represents District 31 and sits as the chair of the Committee on Public Safety. We're grateful for the chance to hear and learn from them. And they'll be joining us shortly because as you can imagine, they're incredibly busy right now. Um, and a special thanks to our co-sponsors uh, for their partnership in this program, Avoda, B'nai Jashrin, Congregation Bates of Khatora, JTS, Hinzel Center for Ethics and Justice, the National Council of Jewish Women New York, Repair the World Brooklyn, and Repair the World Harlem. Um, one quick note, while we are committed to hosting this conversation series, the views and opinions expressed by our panelists do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the co-hosts or the JCC. Um, and SAJ is also a sponsor, my mistake for missing that. Um, and uh, as I can imagine, everyone here has a lot of thoughts and questions about the topic at hand today. Um, and we want the space to be a platform for everyone to engage. So please feel free at any point in time to leave a question in the chat or the Q&A box. If you put your mouse on the screen where you see us speaking, you'll see those options down there and you can send them to me. You can email me questions if that's not working for you. Um, and we'll try and answer them throughout the conversation. Um, and Ruth and Brad, I know our guests are a little, are not quite here yet, but I'm gonna hand it over to you. It's fine. Um, good. So this is Ruth Messenger again. Thank you, Tess, for that comprehensive introduction. And I hope you all heard that this has been true with each of the topics we picked up, the series, which we started of several months ago. The idea of justice in action was to look at different populations, primarily but not exclusively in the city of New York, that were in some dramatic way affected uh, by COVID in a way that seemed unjust, that is inequitable. And every subject that we focus in on the subject has morphed from when we chose it to when we put it on the air we've made demands on our guests to really uh, um, be with us uh, when they have a thousand other places to be hey, and Ashley. as Tess told you well Ashley we'll get to you in a couple of minutes but as Tess told you um, this issue um, morphed from looking at the inequitable policing by police of the social distancing rules. But as it's grown, I just want to be clear that the JCC, the Myerson JCC is hugely distressed by the information about police brutality, is committed to finding a way to end it, knows that with Council Member Lander and our two guests today, we're going to do something to understand some of the causes and some of the solutions. Um, as with all public policy issues, there are many solutions and we're going to start, we're going to try to, un some of them, and give you some follow-up readings and some follow-up actions, but we no longer pretend to be able to any of these issues comprehensively in an hour. So um, please be aware of that. Thank you for the feedback. Um, okay, so Brad, I'm actually, I know you wanna to get to Ashley very quickly and our time is limited, but I think it would be useful if you just gave us a minute or two about the statement that you made about how you are um, connecting up these questions of policing with your responsibility council member. And then I'll let you flip it to Ashley quickly and let's get some, her story and her current. Thank you, uh, Tess and Ruth and Ashley, thank you so much for being here. And I really do wanna move to you uh, right away, both because I know your time is limited and then Donovan Richards' time is limited. So um, I think after you both speak, we're gonna have a little more time. Um, and I think, look, one of the challenges here is 
um, you know, for white people to show up to this conversation with like open ears, how do we listen honestly and bring ourselves into the conversation, be genuinely reflective on what our privilege has brought us, on what pain it is deeply connected to, and what our obligations are to move forward through it is really hard work. It is not as hard as being afraid that your kid is gonna get killed by a police officer, but it's hard because it implicates us, because the anger is really deep, because what it would take to change it is so big, but that's got to be the starting place. So I want to say we're going to start this set of conversations by really listening. Uh, and I feel really honored uh, that Ashley Sawyer, who is a lawyer with Girls for Gender Equity, which is a member of Communities United for Police Reform, have done the work to build a movement for justice in public safety. And I think some people that are kind of paying attention now think like just people got out in the streets and started shouting. Um, what has really been happening is that a set of people, including the family members and mothers of peaceable people who have been killed by police violence and folks who live in and represent and work with black and brown communities have been building this movement um, and we're lucky to be in partnership with them. So uh, Ashley, thank you for doing that work. Thank you for being here today. There's an awkwardness that I just wanna name it about like asking you at this moment in time <laughs> to show up for an audience of, you know, a hundred plus, you know, overwhelmingly white folks, mostly from the Upper West Side. Um, and I just want to say, like, we come here with humility. We're grateful for your time. We're eager to listen and learn and be challenged uh, to think about the things that we're obligated to do as a result. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Councilmember Lander. Um, and I, I am grateful for the openness, right? I think that there's something to be said about both holding the deep rooted pain that black people and people of color hold in this country and how difficult it can be for people of color um, and organizers of color to have to always explain our pain and our issues and also at the same time holding that there is an eagerness from folks who maybe have not been directly impacted to learn and want to dig in a little bit more. So I do wanna just honor that um, and be, and be and just acknowledge it. I want to just say that. I just want to acknowledge it. Um, but yes, there's so much work to be done. And I think that um, I have learned so much from the organizers and the people that came before me. Um, and I really want to recognize again and again that Communities United for Police Reform is made up of, I want to say, over 25 different organizations, many of whom who have been working in this city. I think about Moms Rising at the top of my head. I've been working on this issue in the city for decades. Um, the issue of police violence the criminalization of black and brown bodies, all of these issues did not just emerge in this summer. They've been going on, as you all know, for, for since the beginning of this country, right? And so one of the things that I wanna just keep us thinking about is at the same time, this isn't, um, you know, if you get into an argument with a loved one and you find out that the argument's about something much, much deeper, it's not about the, you know, the toothbrush that they left on the counter. And, I'm, and I don't want to minimize or trivialize the experiences of black folks in this country or people of color in this country, but you, the analogy I'm giving is that there's something much, much deeper, much, much deeper. And it's not about this one incident. It is about a centuries of harm. The question I think I was supposed to be with was like, how did I get into this work? And I'll give the quick and dirty. Um, as a Black person, I grew up um, constantly knowing that myself, my brother, my parents, my cousins, all of us could be harmed at any period of time by people with power. Always understanding that my very presence in this country is a result of kidnapping and enslavement. And so the name that I have, my last name, my parents' last name, my father, my grandfather, that's all a result of the fact that my family and the people who helped, you know, whose DNA runs through me were kidnapped from the home that they knew, deprived of their language, their religion, their culture, everything, and told to work for free for centuries. So always, I I knew that this was my experiences were shaped by all of these forces um, that were beyond my control. And so when I went into law school, I went to a historically black law school, the same law school as Thurgood Marshall, with the eye in mind that I was going to like shift all these systems of oppression. What I have learned since then, since really being spending time with organizers, is that as much as I can file a lawsuit and complain, it actually doesn't shift the systemic issues the way people taking to the streets has and i've learned that organizers have humbled me and taught me over and over again that that's how work gets done um, and then i think it's important for folks to put names and faces and experiences with the the uprisings that we're hearing right now so i decided to focus particularly on youth justice issues because when i first um one of my second jobs out of law school i worked with young people in here in new york who had all been affected by the criminal legal system 
These were all young people who were dealing with the collateral consequences of arrest. Raise the age had not yet passed. And I was working with 16 and 17 year olds, primarily girls who were on Rikers in jail in this city. The harms that those young people had experienced at the hands of police. Um, I can remember a young girl going with her on my last day of work to turn herself into a precinct because she and her mom had had a fight and the fight got ugly and her mom felt overwhelmed, didn't know what to do, who to turn to and to call the police. When I went to, this young woman was also a mom. She was a new mom and she was breastfeeding. So she was worried about sitting in the precinct the whole day, not getting an opportunity to express milk, which ended up happening. The detectives kept us there for hours on hours. Um, but one of the things that came out of that conversation, first of all, the girl's mom, the one who originally called the police, was there saying, I don't want this to go forward. I don't want to keep doing this. I, don't, I just needed help in that moment. I just wanted some support. I was at my wit's end. She and I were not getting along. We were pushing and shoving and I needed help. And this process has actually just made it worse for us. And I think that brings me to the point that I really want to make about the ways that our city and not just New York, across the country, we have not made the right investments. We have spent billions of dollars in controlling people, removing people, and not spent the money to meet the underlying needs that were ignored, particularly for Black families. And this mom, I use her story as an example because I think about when folks get really anxious when we talk about defunding police because there's a fear that the whole world will fall apart. But really, she needed a thing that she was not getting. And because we've eradicated so many of the social services, and not just eradicated, we've never imagined, we never had the space to think about what could happen if a parent, particularly a low-income parent who's working many hours, doesn't have a lot of emotional energy, um, doesn't have necessarily access to the therapy and the resources that might help resolve conflict better, what could we do as a city to make those investments? We never did that. So instead, when a mom feels scared or nervous, we bring in people with guns into her home. And then her daughter is now inside of a system that she never wanted her daughter to be a part of. And she never wanted her daughter to spend a day in a precinct with me turning herself in. That experience is scarred onto my brain. And I could give anecdote after anecdote. Um, you know, I think about a young boy that I worked with who um, the police subjected him to a cavity search out in a park in front of everyone. And that was here in New York. And it, I believe in my heart that that was intended to humiliate him. But that kind of behavior is directly connected to enslavement and some of the practices that were used during enslavement in this country. And so for people who are taking to the streets, this is a long time coming. And while I am excited about the 50A win, I'm excited about special prosecutor and all of those things. These are just literally the tip of the iceberg that gives us more data, Police Stat Act gives us more data to tell us what, what many of us already knew. And so for the folks who are maybe newer to this conversation, I want to you know, really point out that there are real people who have experienced real harm for generations as a result of police violence and that there is a direct connection between systemic racism, policing and enslavement in this country. Um, for most of you, you've probably heard this before, but the first ever police patrols were people who were intended to catch Black people who had escaped from enslavement under the Fugitive Slave Law. And so for me as a lawyer, I, was, I had to reckon with the fact that laws in this country were used to protect property owners and not human beings, and really interrupting my relationship to the law and challenging it. So I know I've probably gone over time, um, but and so just keep me honest around time. But I want to just continue to point out for folks that this is a deep, deep, deep rooted issue. And we're not going to solve it in a day or with one bill or one piece of legislation. We're really going to have to reallocate funding. I keep hearing people say they don't really mean defund or they don't really mean divest. No, we really mean it. And I think what can those feelings, those natural feelings of fear come up? I understand that. Mariam Kaba, who's the great abolitionist that many of us have learned from, I highly encourage folks to read some of Mariam Kaba's work or just listen to a lecture from her or Angela Davis or Beth Ritchie. One of the things Mariam says is that we all have a cop in our head. So we've been taught what safety means by commercials that we saw on TV, little children's books that tell you that cops are your friends. And so it's hard for us to imagine a world where we're divesting from policing and investing in communities because that's all we've ever known. From the time many of us are children, we're taught that there's all these bad people out there and they're gonna do so much harm to us if the police don't um, control them. When in reality, we're living in a community with regular human beings just like us 
some who have better choices and more choices and more options than others. And when harm happens for black people, you're often criminalized. And whereas for people of privilege, white people, when harm happens in a family or in a community, all sorts of, all the stops are pulled out. All of the resources are poured out. What would it look like if those resources were made available? And I believe that many of us on this call, I'm sure coming from a lot of different communities, a lot of different life experiences, if we really started to ask, what does your neighbor need? What does the person who, you know, is on the bench at night sleeping out there, what do they really need? Do they need you to call the police on them because they're sleeping on the bench in your neighborhood or in your park? Or are there other needs that have not been met? Um, so some of us are, we're, are gonna have to do the work to divorce ourselves from the fear that we have around what this world could look like if we stop trying to control people, incarcerate people, and really invest it on the front end. And then some of us are gonna have to be really willing to sit with the discomfort of like not having all of the answers. Um, I am deeply, deeply grateful, and I'll sum up with for the work that CPR has done. Girls for Gender Equity, we're just one piece in this bigger puzzle of movement organizations that have been doing this work for a really long time. Um, and I'll sum up, we you know really what would GGE has been asking for. Our focus is on systemic issues that impact the lives of cis and trans girls of color and non-binary youth of color in New York City and across the country. We've certainly expanded our our reach and our history. Our history is rooted in um, an eight-year-old girl in bread sty was sexually assaulted on her way to school. And our founder and president Joanne Smith knew that we needed to make investments and that we need to to address the way Black girls were impacted by gender-based and sexual violence. And what has come up in the years is that many of the young people that we've worked with have experienced sexual violence at the hands of police, at the hands of correction officers. And so sexual violence isn't something that can be addressed unless we're really getting at the root causes of it in our community. And it, we won't address it if we ignore people whose voices and narratives we don't necessarily want to hear. When I think about that, I'm thinking about girls who were sexually assaulted, like a young person, a 15 year old who was sexually assaulted by a police officer um, uh, in the Bronx, right? And that case kind of like the Daily News ran a story and then we never talked about it again. And I just imagine, you know, if it was a different, if it wasn't a girl of color who was 15 in 2018 when that happened, would people remember that? Would her name be etched or her story be etched into our memories? And so our work is to really reimagine safety. And in this moment, we're really calling, of course, Councilmember Lander knows, we're calling for, resources to be reallocated to the Department of Education, particularly because we're still living in a pandemic and the young people who return to school, whether it's in September or wherever, whenever it's safe to come back to buildings, are going to be carrying a lot of grief and a lot of trauma. Some students manifest grief and trauma by crying quietly and other students might act out. There might be conflict. If the DOE doesn't have enough money to invest in restorative justice practitioners, and I'm not just talking someone to come in and run a peace circle, I'm talking about people who are embedded in a school community to help build cultures of consent, to help build positive school climate. If the DOE does not have the resources to meet those needs, we are going to pay for it. Our young people are going to pay for it. Um, and there's a myriad of different solutions that educators have provided about what it could look like for the young folks to return whenever they return. I mean, what resources do we need? But so often we run up against principals saying, oh, I don't have enough money for that. Or I would need, you know, three or four staff more members to do that. I would need someone who devoted their full time to addressing those needs. And we have to ask ourselves, why don't you have that? Why don't you have a person on staff who's just available to walk the halls and check in with young people and say, are you okay today? Do you need anything? Did you get something to eat? Have you, has your laundry been done? Can I help you get, I could, why don't you have that? Oh, because we spend that money for a school safety agent who is not equipped to meet this young person's needs. So that's GGE's call to action. We just released a report outlining what we expect or what we need from this coming budget, um, which I'm happy to share. I am so deeply grateful for the folks who are plugging in and really giving, willing to give their time and energy to address these issues. And I thank you all for your time. Thank Actually, you. That was phenomenal. Let me just say very quickly, because somebody put in the chat, Tess will take out every report, like the report from GGE, like the readings and the books that you recommend, they'll all be listed in the, so just so oh, you don't have to be writing things down at the speed that, um, that actually is offering them. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Ashley, one, uh, one, Ruth, I think, I can't tell whether the trouble's on the, on your end or mine, but you're, you're slightly frozen. And I, I think I'm still seeing Ashley and Donovan moving. So I think maybe we're, we're, um, you're good, so, friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to welcome uh, City Council Member Donovan Hello, Richards, the, the chair of the Council's Public Safety Committee, who we're going to hear from in just a minute. But uh, 
two quick things. Well, one quick thing from Tess and then maybe one uh, a little more. One is there's a question in the Q&A just about if you could say again the name of the organization that you were working with with young women uh, on Rikers. Yeah, so at that time I was working at a nonprofit called Youth Represent um, and I was we were lawyers representing kids who had collateral consequences and I was just doing mitigation and legal representation on their collateral consequences. Um, we don't know, that organization no longer does work with young people on island. Crazy age has passed, so those young folks have been moved elsewhere. That's not to say that those issues don't still remain. And, and now I'm the policy director, Girls for Gender Equity. And let me just ask you one more question, which I think will be a good kind of transition to bring Donovan into the conversation too, because I think you gave a, a powerful, you know, uh, reflection on how deep and systemic these issues are, kind of how far, far back they go, um, and how we should think of them in that way, rather than you know only as a response to the the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And I think you did a really nice job of also helping people think about you know what that defund uh, means and how to think about it in a way that's reflective of the kind of public safety we want. I wonder if you could just fill a, a, the middle in a little bit, you know, so that past is true, that vision is powerful. Here folks are kind of sitting in this moment, you know, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And then also coming at them are this whole wave of different reform ideas. And uh, Chair Richards is going to talk about some of the bills we heard in the Council Tuesday, and there's the repeal of 50A, and Congress is talking about national laws on chokeholds. And how do you think about you know, and I guess I've heard some people say a version of like, um, those reforms just haven't really gotten it done, only that big transformation will do. And I've heard other people say, let's go step by step, sure, we'll take those reforms, but it can't stop us from marching to this uh, bigger goal. How, you know, how do you, how are you thinking about this, this moment uh, and how would you push us to think about it? Sure, so one thing I'll say is that I'm not thinking about it alone and I wanna to continue to share that space because what I give you as an idea or solution is just one piece of the puzzle and I really do want to continue to point to the people who've been doing this work for so long. I started to think of myself as an abolitionist in reality in 2016-2017. There were folks for in the 90s in the early 2000s who were pushing the city in ways that I could never have imagined. So um, there's a website that just was launched this week called 8 to Abolition, 8 the number 8 to to abolition um, and they have put together a really beautiful model for how do we that in between space like what are the things we need to be working towards one thing that i will try to emphasize is as much as we you know use the term reform to encapsulate wanting to change we have to be careful because i think over the years over the decades small changes have been made that just did not give us what we needed so many of the things that i saw happening to my clients were already illegal so many of the practices that the NYPD was engaging in were already unacceptable, went against the patrol guide. So we have to recognize that we can put something on paper, but it doesn't necessarily change anything. And when we're talking about policing, I want to remind folks that like the origins of policing in this country are rooted in control and cap control of black bodies and um, you know, preservation of white property holders power. And so we really will have to sit with the discomfort of letting go. I see someone put in the chat, you know, like, what about the school shootings? And we recognize that some of the most um, horrific school shootings in our, ish, in our country could not have been prevented if there were more school cops. So we have to really begin to think about what are the things that we need to divest from. And in the in-between, it will be maybe confusing and we're not going to be certain. We're not going to have clear answers. But that is why we need to make the investments at the same time. We have to be making making investments in communities and giving communities the autonomy to decide how they need to use those resources, what is helpful for them, how to meet their needs. That feels extremely, extremely crucial to me, but I want to um, just again lift up the work of CPR coalition members. They have a list of demands, but the first demand is to defund the NYPD by $1 billion. And just remember that over the course of uh, Mayor de Blasio's tenure, the NYPD budget has increased a billion dollars. So the billion dollars that we're asking to be cut this year is actually just to get us back to the levels that we were in six years ago. So that is, I, and I keep seeing these memes on the internet of, you know, how much it costs to give a hospital worker full PPE, something around, some anal analysis say something around $16 versus about the $400 it costs for each officer to have riot gear. 
we have to figure out what is important to us. And I think Black folks are telling people, people who are marginalized are telling folks what's important. And we have to be ready to sit with the discomfort and redirect those resources um, in the meantime. And I would really encourage folks to spend time listening, um, listening to the folks who are doing the work on the ground. Thank you for that question. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and I've just put in the chat, Communities United for Police Reform's website, changethempd.org, and we'll send that out as well. Um, Ashley, if you're able to stay, then you're most welcome, and we'd love to keep you in the conversation, but you've given us more time already than you promised, and there's a lot going on. So if you have to leave, we'll uh, transition to, uh, to Chair Richards, and uh, with great gratitude for, uh, for your time today, but, but, and your uh, helping uh, push us, uh, but even more for the work that you're that you're doing. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce really a very dear friend. Um, Donovan Richards uh, was elected to the city council in uh, 2012 uh, and has really just been um, a tremendous leader in the council. First, he's fought, I mean, he'll, he'll tell you his personal story that he brings to the table his community and the Rockaways and the ways that he's shown up. I mean, in the time he's been in office, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, the COVID crisis hit, um, you know, police killings have hit, and he has shown up for his district on the ground that he kind of comes from. Uh, but he also now, for the last several years, has been the chair of the Council's Committee on Public Safety, uh, you know, and has, has brought all of those experiences uh, long before this moment, and definitely in this moment, uh, you know, it will send you the link to the hearing that he chaired uh, the other day, a 10-hour hearing, um, you know, in which there was an effort to give people some space to tell their story, and boy, the NYPD did not show up to listen, but Chair Richards uh, did, and Donovan, it's, we're really grateful, I said this to Ashley at the top, but I just want to, like, uh, say thank you, you know, in this moment with everything going on, to come talk to this group of 150 white folks, mostly from the Upper West Side, you know, we, we honor the challenge that like being asked over and over again to like explain racism to us, there's like something wrong with it. Um, and we're really grateful for your willingness to, to come talk with us and, and to challenge us. So thank you for being here. I'm well, glad, thank Brad, you. And Chairman, Richards, Chairman Richards, just before you get going, I wanna say thank you again to Ashley. And I wanted to tell everyone's flooding the chat room, we promise you, we will send you the name of every organization, every link, <laughs> Book that you heard mentioned because part of this, as Brad has been saying, is listening, and listening is equated with learning. And there are lots of different ways to learn, and there are lots of groups, lots of questions, lots of proposed solutions. And in, the first thing it's going to take for many of us, including myself, is to really do a deeper dive not only into what people's experiences have been, but what the different recommendations are, why they make sense, where they don't make sense, what each of us thinks of them. And what are going to be the issues immediately on the table, which I know some of which Chairman Richards will mention, but we'll get this to all of you. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome, Chairman Richards. Thank you, Ruth. I'm such a fan. I, I, I'm having like one of those moments now, like, uh, like this is history, um, but great to see you and thank you for paving the way uh, and for all the work you've done and to Ashley, uh, who's continuously doing great work in, in the struggle and has, has the lived experience. Thank you. And to my friend Brad, you know, who really uh, stepped up to the plate in a big way for me um, when I ran for office. I didn't know what the heck running for office would feel like, um, but he was somebody who was constantly in my corner, who helped to guide me in those moments of uncertainty. And that's, that's why we're all here, right? How do we all work collectively together to build a stronger nation, a stronger city, a stronger country? And it starts by embracing each other's struggles and learning each other's struggles. And you know, one of the things I appreciate about Brad is he doesn't pretend to know the black struggle, but he's always a, um, a partner in the struggle. He's always looking at creative ways to, to even the, the, the uh, field for us. And I wanna thank him for his, his leadership and friendship throughout the years in building a more equitable city. Um, I'm New York City Council Member Donovan Richards, but uh, you know, I will start just um, briefly what my experience is being a black man, because when you, when you come into the world, as you're not, you don't come in as an elected, and it doesn't really matter that you're elected when you're black too, right? I mean, when you're in your car and a police car is in your rear view mirror, you still get that fear. That all goes out the window. I can't get a cab outside City Hall just like any other black man, right? 
Um, so it's just very important for us to, to, for me to set the stage that way um, because we have to endure racism and bias even in our positions. Um, coming into the world at 13 years old, my first experience was stop and frisk. I mean, I was a teenager walking up the block to, uh, with my cousin to a friend's home and stopped on the streets of Merrick Boulevard in Jamaica, Queens. Um, they said we fit the description of robbers, although we just had left my grandmother's house just four blocks away uh, in Rochdale Village. And, you know, I didn't know back then that if they asked you, do you have something in your pockets, not to go in them and show them you have nothing in your pockets. So that caused four guns to be drawn on my cousin and I, who both were about 13. He was actually 12, I think. And uh, thank God we survived to tell that tale. But then you fast forward and you continuously have these experiences with the police department moving into high school. You know, we talk about that prison to school pipeline where we had to go through scanning in my school. And it was not pretty. You would go into this dark and gloomy auditorium at Jamaica High School when it was Jamaica High School and you would have to go through scanning and God forbid you turn red and you showed up to school trying to get to your classroom one time, um, but you're held up because there's this perception that you may have a weapon, especially as a black male. Um, and, uh, and obviously you got patted down and wanded down and it felt like that, that Rikers Island feel, right? And then when you left the school building, they had cops on horses and police officers on every corner. And their job was to guide you to the bus stop to get you home and off Jamaica Avenue. Even if you just wanted to go and get some ice cream, you couldn't loiter outside the, the, the store and talk to your friends. If you were criminalized or the perception of you because of the color of your skin, being a, a criminal was there. Um, so that's, that's been my experience. I mean, and that, there's so many others. I could go on and on about my father and I sitting on our home stoop and unmarked car pulls up and says, what are you guys doing sitting here? And we're like, this is our house. <laughs> um, you know, that, that experience, those are experiences that don't leave you. And that's why we're in this moment we find our end where there's this anger and it's righteous anger. And it's, now it's what do we do with it, right? Um, you know, seeing George Floyd with that neck, uh, his, with his knee, uh, with that officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I don't care who you are. If that didn't spark something in you, something's wrong with you. Um, Sean Bell was my neighbor. Um, I was there. I, I was there the night he was killed. I was at his house. All right. Um, um, really good friends with the family. I threw his daughter, his, his last daughter, who's now graduated in high school, her first birthday party. He couldn't be there, obviously, um, for that reason. Um, but these are our experiences. And this is why in the council, it's been, uh, you know, and Brad will tell you, and Brad has been an ally in this fight. We have not taken it easy on the NYPD. And it's not that we are anti-police. And there's this misconception that, you know, if you're strong and you address inequities and you address the systematic issues that plague the police department, that you are anti-police. And that's the way some of my our colleagues will frame us on the more conservative spectrum. Can you take it easy on them? If we don't use the moments and power that we get to make transformational change, transformational change, why are we here? We have to ask ourselves. So, you know, very early on, and Brad will tell you this when the Wall Street Journal profiled me, I made it very clear that it's okay if I'm not invited to every police party to eat, you know, to eat good turkey. It's okay. We have a job to do. Um, and subsequently, that really did happen. I was disinvited to events as we started to make um, our mark in this committee. Um, so just fast forward, just some of the work we did. We did a lot of work around marijuana justice. My committee, um, when I came in, led the city in marijuana summonses and arrests um, for nearly a decade, a black middle-class neighborhood, um, were relatively little crime. I mean, if you rank the precinct um, in terms of crime in the city, it wouldn't even reach, it wouldn't even be in the top tier of commands um, with crime. But the problem is that those disparities still existed, that racial bias amongst officers still existed. And let me just also say this, um, you know, in context of race, you know, we, Danique Miller and I, who represents a, uh, the district adjacent to me, literally across the street, we live across the street from each other, literally. Um, this was a black inspector who was locking up a lot of our kids, right? So I just want to put that in context because this is, 
Um, this is a blue issue. It's not just by race, even though we know that a lot of the incidents are driven um, by race and by white individuals in the department because the majority of the department is white, that polices our neighborhoods, right? And we would be um, foolish not to say that. If you look at majority of our precincts, it's majority made, majority of it is white men who are policing our neighborhoods um, here in our communities who don't have our lived experience and who don't quite frankly want to understand our lived experience. So we were able to make a lot of progress in that space of, um, of marijuana justice. Happy to say, I think we went from 20,000, Brad, down to 300, but those disparities still exist. I mean, still 90% of the marijuana arrests, and uh, I'm sure, you said this is the Upper West Side, I'm sure you'll find people smoking weed on the Upper West Side, <laughs> right? But you won't see those numbers. Um, then you turn to, um, you know, you look at just a lot of examples, social distancing arrests and summonses, how, People were given masks and we were giving arrest and summonses. It's just, and no, and that's why this moment has caused people to bubble up. Uh, Brad, you'll tell me when to shut up. But this is why this moment where people's anger and pain is out there. And this is why people, you're getting 400 or 500 people marching every day in our neighborhoods, partly because of these things. I'll fast forward into just um, now um, some areas we certainly are interested in. And I'm certainly supportive of the budget, justice budget. Um, I, I'm supportive of cutting a billion dollars. We got to figure out how to do it in a real way. Um, you know, it's easy to throw that number out, but I also want to caution people that just because you cut a billion dollars doesn't mean that racism is all of a sudden gone out of the police department. And it seems to be this fixation that if you cut the budget, all of a sudden race and bias and over-policing just goes away overnight. Just do it. It's done. It doesn't work that way in the real world. So really, we have to look at, um, and, 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 and cutting the budget does send a signal that we are prioritizing the interests of our communities. Education, PPE, I lost 800 people to COVID in my district. Over 1,000 in my district, actually, I'm sorry. 800 in the Rockaways alone. Majority black and brown New Yorkers who work hard, whose hospital was overfilled, who didn't have enough PPE, who didn't have testing sites, who didn't have tracking, we just got our first testing sites like last week from the mayor. Um, and this is what we were fighting like heck for um, because those that any inequity is what caused COVID-19 to certainly kill my constituents and friends. I lost a lot of friends in the struggle. Um, so we need to make sure the budget, a budget speaks of your priority. You can't cut some of youth employment program, which keeps our young people off the street and then fund a new police class at the same time. And don't tell me the new police class is gonna keep overtime costs down because when we did 1300 cops, that was the argument in 2015. We'll save money for this city, overtime will decrease. But what we saw is the opposite. Last year, overtime soared to $780 million. Hmm, uh, sounds like there's no efficiency or real oversight measures on overtime. That's an area we can look at. We can look at youth services. All the things Brad, I'm sure I talked about before I got on, how do we reimagine what policing looks like in the 21st um, century? Um, this next stated we're passing a merit of bills. One of the bills I'm most proud of that I, that I just finally got my final uh, copy of is my bill on the discipline matrix, which is going to pass. And this is going to mandate the police department and the police commissioner to come up with a framework on discipline and infractions and punishment. Right now it's the wild, wild west. I'm one of the few council members who's actually got to look at police officer disciplinary files, um, despite 50A being um, there. Thank God 50A is gone. Because what you're going to see when the files start rolling out is that some of these officers should actually be in jail for criminal offenses. But they're still uh, in our communities um, working on our streets. And the problem is the public doesn't know who's policing our communities. Um, so, so that's it. Um, we're passing the chokehold bill, um, which thank God is going to be strong. Um, and, you know, and then a myriad of other things. Don't block your badge. I mean, I've been to barbecues where the police come in storming. I remember these experiences. Um, and they, they smack your phone out your hand and they arrest you if you record them. All right. And then they charge you with obstruction for justice. And I've seen that happen to my peers. Um, I've seen my peers mates the same way. I mean, this is going back years and years ago. Um, 
So what can you do if you're on this line? Um, one, listen. I think that's the first thing is to, you, you know, there's been this perception that we have made these things up for all of these years. Um, the only difference now is that, let's be honest, you know, there are a lot of younger white protesters now out who are getting hit with batons. That, that has been our experience for a long time. And a lot of people are getting a taste of it over the last of the two weeks. But this has constantly been an issue for our communities going back decades, including when the Howard Beach case where they went into black men's homes, 200 black men showed up at their doors and took their DNA, although they were not even a suspect in a crime, and put it in a database in which they're still in, although they were found guilty of nothing. But they'll be criminalized, even their DNA, for the rest of their lives. Um, so you can listen um, and join us um, and you know, give us the space and have the conversation with us, because we know where we need to go. Um, those are things you can do if you're in this moment at the time. The word defund, as I close out, has started to take on a negative connotation, partly because, um, you know, there has not been enough conversations and education within the community itself that's hurting, the communities that have endured this pain for a long time. So now the word has sort of been co-opted by people, and I, I definitely agree, one day we got to get to a place where we don't need police, but we're not there in our communities yet. So we have to be careful and make sure that we're educating and speaking and talking and building those coalitions and having folks at the table who, who live this so that we can keep control of the conversation and narrative and not allow you know the media or president trump to co-op these conversations and turn it around on us in the long term so i know i've been long-winded i want to thank you for having me brad that's just a snippet of things i mean obviously the committee's been hard at work for two years um, and we were calling for even slight cuts two months ago um, because I didn't think there would even be a political will to have the conversation around a billion dollars. But thanks to you out there, or a hundred of you on this line, those of you who protested, you've brought systematic change and we're gonna change this thing and we gotta ride it while we're here in this moment. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Donovan. And I'll flag on your last point for folks on the call just so they know. I mean, I think you and I uh, were the first two elected this year to say there ought to be a hiring freeze. This was seven, yep. eight weeks ago, you know, yep. at the kind of beginning of the COVID crisis, you know, long before George Floyd's uh, killing. And, you know, the mayor came with a budget that said, we're gonna have to cut seven and a half billion dollars. So we're gonna put a hiring freeze on teachers and mental health counselors mm -hmm. and parks workers. Uh, we won't freeze uh, health and hospitals hiring. Okay, we definitely need to keep the nurses and doctors coming to confront the COVID crisis. And we won't put a hiring freeze on the NYPD, so we'll hire 2,300 new police officers uh, next year. And you, as the public safety chair, and I, in a meeting with the mayor about the budget, were the you know the two folks who spoke up. And at the time, you know, and I you know I don't say you know no no other members were yet talking about it. Yep. Um, it was uh, and so now like the times ran rapidly past us where yeah, like, exactly. like oh just a hiring freeze that's nothing <laughs> but, uh, but i want to honor you know that that work that you've been doing for a, a long time there's some um, i think an easy question in the chat in the q a here that i can just ask when you say that the chokehold law will definitely be passed uh how can you be so sure because i'm the chair <laughs> <laughs> um and um and actually um the beauty is uh you know I, i'm in very close contact uh, last night they were aging the bills um and we made sure these bills were really strong um and i anticipate we're going to have passage i think this is just a unique moment in history i do think that you'll have the same voices who are very you know pro-police not pro-reform who will vote against these things and say we're handcuffing the cops but I think there are a minute amount of folks. I think there's a broad coalition between the Progressive Caucus, the Black and Latino Asian Caucus, and I feel relatively good about where we're at. And if the mayor looks to veto, we, we are gonna overcome that as well. So I think we're in a strong place, and, and that's because of you. Um, can, uh, council member, this is, this is fantastic, and I appreciate your personal stories. I actually have questions um, and they probably seem more mundane but I want to drill down on a couple of issues I know that in various settings and in some articles um, recently but also I can think of this way back my time in city government you could find people in the police department who said that the police department is asked to do many too many things that they're supposed to be 
figuring out how to patrol school, that they're supposed to do domestic violence, they're supposed to do food carts, they're supposed to do, you know, we remember that on our case, they're supposed to do seriously disturbed people, they don't have any training for that. And I'm just wondering, in your role as chair, do you actually have these conversations? Have we had people within the last couple of years of, of your time from the police department who've actually agreed that that what they're recruited for and waiting for has much more to do with sort of the TV image of cops and, and that they're then expected to do a variety of things that probably are too many to begin with and certainly that they're not trained for. If you could just comment on that. Oh, absolutely. Commissioner O'Neill himself. Um, I, I remember doing, a, I think, a two or three day conference on disparities um, with the police commissioner, O'Neill, who was forced into sort of having this hard conversation um, I believe by Tracy who ran his department on disparities or something like that. And she was a black woman and she sort of got him into this space and got him into this room. And it was very uncomfortable because the police commissioner at that time had to admit that there's systematic racism in the police department. There were no cameras. It was every DA, every city agency. And it was just a unique moment. And most people will never have seen. I got to see the police department and the police commissioner admit that the police department shouldn't be involved in these things, that a lot of things reach the police department's doorstep that shouldn't meet, meet that shouldn't reach it, right? Like homeless outreach, um, uh, uh, EDPs, right? Um, uh, and all the things you talked about, vendors. But it wasn't just that agency, let's be clear. What we got to the root of at that specific conference is that every agency in, a New, in New York City has some bias in it and that they need to look themselves in the mirror as well and they need to take some responsibility as well because the police department shouldn't be locking some people up for these things. Now we can argue that he make fundamental changes after that conversation. Nah, it was a great conversation. Um, but you know, one story I remember is Saeed Basu and Brad remembers this. Saeed Basu was um, a, a person who had some mental health issues um, who unfortunately had an episode, many of you may remember this, who ran up the street with a sharp object in his, ha in his hand and it, people called it in as a gun and he was gunned down by the, um, uh, forgot the, 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 the department in the PD, but the uh, SRG, Strategic Response Group, um, who handles domestic terrorism, supposed to handle terrorism. And they, they were in Bedstuy, Brooklyn, got called for uh, that issue. And I remember the police commissioner calling me at that moment and saying, Donovan, what could we do? And we said, you need to look at your EDP stuff and we need to work with local organizations. Why aren't these services in communities? And out of that, we came up with this fancy task force with like a 200 people on it. Um, but they, the problem I had is at the end of that task force conversation, which went on for about a month or two, very good organizations who do this work every day, day in and day out, there was not really a substantial bucket of money put aside for them to actually set up in these communities. So that was the problem we had. You gotta have these services on the ground, otherwise it's knocking at the police door. So that's what I would say there, but absolutely. I mean, Brad will tell you every hearing we have, whether it's homeless outreach, domestic violence, um, DV, you know, how are these, how are we working with the people rooted on the ground and how are we um, actually giving them and building their capacity to handle this stuff. If you're a black or brown indigenous organization on the ground, it's very hard for you to handle a $10 million um, uh, uh, grant because you don't have that capital sitting in the bank. So how do we build that capacity so that they could handle it and address um, you know, these systematic issues on the ground from a community-based standpoint? And let, let me build a little on that. Um, Donovan, thank you for all that perspective. I, you know, when Saeed Vassal was killed, it was in 2018. Mm -hmm. And what it reminded me was that back in 2012, um, the first family member I ever met of somebody who had been killed by the NYPD came to see me. And her name is Hawa Ba. Uh, she lives uptown in, in Harlem. Um, her son, Mohammed, uh, you know, had a history of, of mental illness, but, you know, was a, you know, like a fully functioning, you know, person, lived at home. He was having an episode. And she called 911 because she needed an ambulance. Uh, and she said, I need an ambulance. My son is, you know, is, is sick. He's having trouble. Can you please send an ambulance? Uh, we did not send an ambulance. We sent NYPD officers. She tried to stop them at the door. Like she knew that was not an ambulance. She said, no, I called an ambulance. I didn't call police. I don't need police. The police broke down the door to her house, ran into the house, 
and killed Mohammed. Um, and she actually, I heard her just, she was, uh, today's Thursday, on Tuesday, she spoke outside City Hall with a bunch of the other family members. And, you know, that meeting with her is seared in my mind. But as part of what I'm sitting with is, um, you know, that was in 2012. So I knew in 2012, we needed to stop having the NYPD respond to calls of emergencies for people in mental distress. And, and I've said it a few times since then, but I haven't fought hard enough for it. You know, I've been on the side of the various police reforms we've done, the Community Safety Act and the NYPD Inspector General. But, you know, if you've been, I've been sitting here all these years, you know, eight years, knowing that we let that continue to happen because we make our primary emergency mental health response sending police. And that's what we do in domestic violence. We know it's a terrible idea. People don't want to call the PD and, and be afraid that the police are going to come kill their partner. And usually they themselves don't get treated with the kind of help and support that would help them get free. Why are we doing with that, that with policing? And in our schools and in traffic safety and in social distancing, you know, I think if you think about, you know, the last 10 times you saw a police officer, you might think out of how many of those 10 times did it really make sense to send someone with a gun whose tools are handcuffs and summons and incarceration in a country where we know systemic racism means that if we're sending people all those times, sometimes it's gonna go like it went with George Floyd and Muhammad Ba. And I've just sat and lived with that, you know, and that's part of what I'm sitting with this week and part of the reason why I have felt, you know, called to be much bolder is that all those reforms, while well-intentioned, have not responded to, have not risen to the level of Mama Ba's challenge to us. And so to be sitting with it eight years later, it's like more is required. And so, I mean, I proudly support all the reforms that Donovan is shepherding through his committee, you know, and I hear Ashley saying, you know, and I hear myself saying, I don't know if they're gonna do any good, you know, but we gotta criminalize chokeholds and have a, a discipline matrix. But moving forward to a big, bold defunding uh, is part of signaling that we get it, so I'm going to be in there fighting along with Donovan to see if we can get to a billion dollars. And I'm not going to vote for a budget that doesn't significantly uh, cut the NYPD's budget. But I really agree with Donovan then and Ashley as well. Then the question will be, what next? Can we move out of this moment into a broader kind of truth and reconciliation uh, commission or considering? And then can we go you know, function by function, 911 call by 911 call. So I hope what people will hear in defund the NYPD is if we think seven or eight or nine of those times we send police should instead be done by emergency mental health responders or school counselors or folks who know how to help a survivor of domestic violence get free, then let's dismantle this thing called the NYPD. There'll be some things, at least for now, that we need to send you know, armed officers to because we got too many guns out there on our streets, but there are so many more we could do in these different ways. And if we could follow up on that, you know, then we will really be paying a kind of honor to this moment. And so really what, um, Brad, what both of you are talking about is a kind of comprehensive reimagining of public safety, of how we keep ourselves safe, of how we protect the people in the city of New York. I wanna ask you to drill down for this budget and this summer for, for a minute, because I believe it's the case that um, all summer youth employment has been canceled. I don't know what other services have been canceled. We don't yet know whether there's gonna be school in the fall. What, is the, what are the most immediate things that you're just two of, you're just two members of the council, but you are two members of the council. What are some immediate things that you would wanna see the city fund in any event, because you think defunding them is dangerous, where there might be a useful transfer of money? So just an example or two from each of you, would, I think people put their minds around this. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, NYPD came to us um, and Brad and I laughed about this with a mere $10 million in overtime savings this year. And it was just like, we're in a pandemic. Like you're not policing parades, like there've been parades postponed. Um, you know, Yankee Stadium, where they spent 2.5 million in overtime, is not happening right now. There's no baseball going on, um, and that's just that's just a natural place to look. There's a lot of overtime abuse, um, 
So I, I would start certainly there. I think Brad would go in. I mean, we both talked about the hiring freeze and insure, and attrition, right? And then also you think about some of the duties that police officers do that they shouldn't do, that DC 37 workers clearly can do. We could probably right. save $40 million off of taking police officers off of the clerical desk, right? Like that's work that um, DC 37 workers could, who can do. And one of the things I love about DC 37 workers is, is that they're representative of our communities as well. So that's, that's just an easy one. Um, Brad, I'll leave you more. But, there's, but you know, those are just, overtime is where I'm focused at. The police class, definitely. And there's a lot more to bite there. Uh, so, Brad, I'll yeah. leave you. No, that's a lot of it. I would add this, the NYTPD has proposed this year actually to expand a couple of different youth and social service programs mm -hmm. that they have to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. So those programs are being in the budget proposed to be left alone, even while all the summer youth programs are being cut. And you know, I don't think it was ill-intentioned of the NYPD. You see why they like the idea of saying, look, we have these youth and social service programs, but it, it speaks exactly to what we're saying. Like the goal needs to be to shrink the footprint of the space where we have state sanctioned, you know, uh, violence, state sanctioned incarceration. And so if we got some money for youth and social service programs, let's have it in youth and social service agencies um, and not at the NYPD. Um, I want to uh, I, I want to ask these questions, and I guess maybe both Donovan and I can take a crack at them because there are some concerns uh, in the chat about the defund NYPD language. You know what happens? You know are we you know are we worried that crime you know rises? Um, you know what evidence do we have that we can keep the city safe? And you know is, that's a few different things. The a fear I think of the language of defund NYPD just is that the smartest language? and also um, you know, some anxiety about if we really followed through on it, you know, what about places where, where crime continues? And I, I think it'd be worth both Donovan and I kind of giving our, given our thoughts in response to that. And okay. I totally, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, close a, to out of time. yeah, that's a loaded question. I'll be quick, but look to Camden, New Jersey. I mean, they've had a lot of these conversations and you know, while they, it's not perfect and I've been sort of studying their model of how they dismantled their police department and, made some real improvements. I, I had family in Camden. I know it's a very, it's one of the, it was one of the most violent places in the country, actually. A lot of murders there at, at one time for the um, population per capita um, there, but it seems to be that's been the model that's continuously come up. And I agree with you on language. I mean, this is why I said, you know, sort of the defund language has, you know, there are some people who are really on the extreme and, it, it, and we could get there one day. I don't, I just, I'm just not there yet who are just saying abolish the police department. That's not a reality for me right now. I mean, I take shootings in my community still, unfortunately, but one of the answers to those shootings has been the crisis management system and cure violence organizations. People rooted in the community who actually went to Rikers Island and spent time, or people who know the gangbangers and have those relationships and can stop shootings that the police will never ever be to stop. You can't police every corner 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, so really, we have to make sure that we're, the redistribution of funding and services are happening for these communities. And that's the way you keep them safe. The police cannot keep our communities safe alone. We need them. We need them to be a part of the conversation. But it really has to be rooted in the community. And that means ensuring that our schools are invested in, that our hospitals are being invested in, that there's affordable housing, that there's infrastructure that we have the basic necessities that other communities have. And I can't say we have that right now. We're getting there, but we're not there. And I just wanna add one word here and then I'll say thank you to Donovan and hand it back to Ruth. And I, I guess what I think when people say some version of, I'm afraid of that language is the following. I, I'm, I'm so much more afraid we'll do too little change rather than too much change. You know, it's like, we got a force of 36,000 police officers right now. And if we're looking at what keeps happening, you know, um, I think what I'm afraid of is we won't be bold enough to really meet this moment. And one of the reasons we won't is white fear. And, you know, so it's all right, I feel like to kind of have in your head, what does that really mean? And where have they done it? And can I see the evidence? And how do I know? Like, okay. But I would also just urge people then to like, take a deep breath and say, if I was going to listen, let me listen a little more. Let me consider the possibility that what is much more likely to happen, since we know, right, like we remember 
when Eric Garner was killed. And I remember like I went out and got arrested when Amadou Diallo was killed in 1999. What is unfortunately our history tells us is we will not make enough change. So like those people who are really pushing us, let's just do our best to listen and kind of lean in and, and be partners and, and rise to, to meet the moment as best we can. So I wanna, I wanna um, thank Ashley who's gone. I wanna thank Chairman Richards who obviously is overwhelmingly busy. And I wanna thank Brad who was he and Donovan are on the front lines on this. And I wanna reiterate, we, as I said at the beginning of the program, but not all of you were there at the beginning, these are really complicated issues and they require some degree of exploration. As Brad said, some degree of listening. As Donovan said, some degree of drilling down. Um, we need, we are hoping that everyone on this call, including those of you with fierce questions, will take a look at the follow-up recommendations, will consider what makes comfortable for you to get your mind, what, which solutions make sense to you, and, and you then connect up with some of the organizations that are advancing some of those solutions. I want to very quickly give you some more information on this when we write to you, but give you back the dollar amounts of this. We have a police department budget that's about $6 billion. That's billion with a B. It's grown over a billion dollars in the last seven and a half years. The proposal is to make some of those cuts. I want to put that, just share a couple of other numbers with you to try to keep in your head. Currently, the main budget, I believe, eliminates all summer youth jobs, eliminates half the funding from the Department of Youth and Community Development. And I want to share one other number with you. And again, this is not an immediate transfer, but I want you to know that out of the $6 billion police budget, the city of New York spends about $240 million a year settling claims that are made against the police department for inappropriate handling of civilian, civilian institutions and whatever. So I just suggest to you that that's not a useful use of our dollars. You cannot eliminate that tomorrow. It requires a whole deep drill down understanding of what do we need to do in training? What do we need to do in handling those complaints and charges? So this is like all budget issues, complicated, but there is a need right now to address some of these issues in this year's budget, which I believe has to be adopted at the end of this month. And so both in terms of time and willingness to engage with all of you, I want to join Brad in thanking um, Chairman Richards, and I want to thank Brad for his continued capacity to do this program with me. And I want to tell you just quickly, advertisement, that next week we will return to the issue of domestic violence. We're leaving Council Member um, uh, Ander an opportunity to go fight on the budget, and I will be um, overseeing a program of domestic violence with a woman named Tally Weinstein who is committed to this work. Thank you all, and thank you for your questions in chat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Donovan. Great to have you here. Thank you. So much. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.